Thank you so much, everyone. We're back again. Uh, looking forward to this amazing panel discussion that we're going to run right now. Uh, but uh, we wanted to talk about growth and the seed of growth, really. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, what are some factors that we can touch on today that will enable you to look at your life and business uh, by, by growing. Uh, so growth has a lot of meaning, but I'll touch on a little bit of that with the panel discussion that we're going to have. But I wanted to do this intro quickly. So the ability to cope and rise with uh, to the inevitable challenges and problems that we have in business uh, really lies in the heart of what well-being and that mindset comes from. So this is why we have this panel discussion. I've got Dr. Maria, Dr. M. Uh, Zushman, uh, yes, hey, got it right, which is excellent. And I've got <laughs> Karen uh, Lebsam from Carajan Kitchen as well. And I've got Phil Preston. So I'm going to read a little bit about their background so that you guys are aware of uh, who they are. Uh, so Dr. Maria Zushman, uh, Dr. M. is, uh, as she is affectionately known, uh, has a passion for helping community and help, uh, to feel and function better in all aspects of their lives. And she helps them uh, identify and remove interferences that are holding them back. So uh, she is an integrative um, integrative chiropractor, podcaster, speaker, uh, facilitator, stress adaption, and performance coach. Welcome, uh, Dr. M. Thanks. Um, and we've got Phil. Uh, Phil Preston, in his early work, was compelled to bring business and community interests together. Uh, so he found that individuals and businesses and organizations, they work with and can contribute something great uh, and his purpose to help them um, realize this potential. So really trying to realize the potential of building purpose within organization. Thank you, Phil. And uh, Karen. Uh, Karen is the CEO and, of, uh, and founder of Carajon Kitchen, Lavosh, uh, a famous Australian brand. So if you love your cheese, I love my cheese. <laughs> it's one of the best <laughs> things to have uh, with, uh, with, uh, from Karen. Uh, and uh, basically raised in the inner city of um, uh, the Housing Commission by her grandmother, uh, Karen Ray, uh, built this amazing small business from scratch. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, you. Excellent. Karen, I might start with you because sure. uh, you know you've got a really interesting story, so I want to touch on that. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about your background and share, you know, um, uh, what contribution you know in building that resilience that you had in business and where you came from? So. Certainly, thank you. Yeah, I think if I take my go back to my very early days, of course, um, I was born in 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 a city and brought up in public housing in um, in Sydney. And from there, I actually lost my dad when I was very young. He suicided at a, when I was a very young age. And then from there, I was a twin. I became very, and then one of three, but having been very supportive of my, and caring for my children, mm. uh, my, sorry, apologies, my siblings. Um, and I was always the tallest of the three, so I became the carer <laughs> of the three. Yeah. Um, from there, I actually... Moved from Housing Commission Year 10, went through to Year 10. It, I really wanted to be a maths teacher, Elm, mm, okay? And that wow. didn't actually happen because <laughs> my mum couldn't, we couldn't afford to put me through to Year 12. Yeah. And so I decided, she decided that if I didn't get a job at the end of uh, the school holidays in Year 10, I could go back through to Year 12. But, mm. of course, she had a job for me three days out, out of Year 10. <laughs> so the rest of that is where I went. Um, and then rolled on into um, early marriage, ended up early divorce, ended up um, into a few years of independence. And then around about 1990, mm. um, Ben, my, my husband, business partner, came along and by 93 we had started a business known as Courage on Kitchen La Bosch. So 28 years on, mm. having had an idea, we now built that Australian brand. Oh, fantastic. Oh, well, uh, Maria actually has a, an amazing point around this in terms of the fitting in uh, part because Karen started off with an amazing story around <laughs> uh, touching on that. So wh why do you think uh, trying to fit in uh, versus um, uh, fitting out 
creates, uh, you know, a stress response and can make us, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, can make us sick, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a great question, Ian, but I think a lot of us are taught from very early on to try and fit in and fly under the radar. And there are three things that create stress mm -hmm. within, our, within our system chemical stress, emotional stress, or physical stress. And when we're trying to fly under the radar, that can set all three off. Mm. And so by actually leaning into exactly who we are, whether that's a unique idea, which I love your products, by the way, <laughs> I've eaten you. truckloads of it, <laughs> is that um, by leaning into the idea that's unique to us, it actually means that we can live our true life to our true values, as we were speaking a little earlier. Yeah. Um, and it means that instead of actually creating a stress response within our system, we're actually able to create more energy for the stuff that we love to do. Yeah, fantastic. And this is where I think, you know, obviously, uh, Karen, your resilience, you can... You can tell you've been through a, a fair bit there, uh, and uh, one of the things you know that Carriage on Kitchen, um, w with the history that that the Australian brand, really quite prominent out in the market, uh, but there would have been a lot of factors to create a brand like that as a small business, um, and you, you know uh, a business gets stronger through resilience. Everybody says that, yes. uh, but I, I want to hear a little bit about the specific. Uh, experiences that you went through that, that created that resilience for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, back in, if I think of, you know, in 93, we started Courage on Kitchen Lavosh and it was an idea and it rolled from there and we started selling 30 packets a week and when it suddenly had legs, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and we were selling those to a Sydney distributor and mm. we would go along and sell our 30 packets per week great start thinking we got $30 back then for our 30 packets a week. We went and had a good old Chinese feed in Chinatown in Sydney before we filled the van up and headed back up the mountain to actually keep the restaurant going for the six days of operations. So the that became a little bit of um, relief almost, you know, a little bit of an outing from away from building the business. So when you think of work-life balance, I suppose that was the work-life balance. We, we rolled into, from the 30 packets a week, we now produce 756,000 pieces a day, which is an amazing, mm. you know, but we started very small and we've had a, a journey of challenges and success doesn't look like this, mm. a straight line. It's up, down, two steps forward, three steps back, in, out, personalities that come into that, personal, mm. um, personal issues. So if I take you back to 93 by... Um, 1997, we had a defining moment in our business. We took a stand at Fine Food Show and decided if we were going to build the business mm -hmm. or not build the business. Excellent. Cole's um, supermarket manager came along and said, love your product, your packaging won't work, gave us a listing in Coles, and it's why we sit in Australian pantries today. Yeah. Absolutely. But then came the hard work. We thought that was great, but then came the hard work. Mm -hmm. By 2004, we were six years on the shelf well-known brand, the biscuits that you eat from every other Australian brand, Arnott's, came along and decided they wanted to come out with the competitive Lavosh. And what they did was they priced higher than us and they actually mm. said by pricing higher they really went, we're better than you and we'll take your market. So what we had to do was think outside the square. And as a family business, we've put six years of, you know, sweat, Mm -hmm. Tears, everything can do it. Your entire life as businesses do, it's small business. And we thought we are dead in the water. That was mm -hmm. it. So we reached out differently, put a little note inside our packets, spoke to our consumer, and it was a David and Goliath um, battle. And we didn't name the company. I can now because we're still here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we didn't then name the company. And our buyer in the supermarket tells us we outsold that brand two to one and we stayed on the shelf. Yeah. So there is, you know, the challenge that that bought actually was in fact, you know, we did. We went through fear. We went through absolutely, my goodness, we're going to lose everything. Where do we go? Mm. But we, we dug deeper. That was 6, uh, 93 to 2004. Come into 2012, hmm. we nearly lost the business hook, line and sinker, I say. Wow. And that's 19 years in business. You think you're doing great, 20 years in. You're nearly 20 years. And it was just some silly things we didn't see. We didn't see the writing on the wall. There were certain things. We were naive still in the business. Yeah. One thing I talk about in business we had to dig deep because I talk about, and we've had this conversation, Dr. M, is that 
um, get your ego out of your business because mm. I think we were. We were in love with being in love with yeah. the business and that type of thing. So your business is an entity. But where it took us by having our ego in the business, we did nearly lose, I always say, the house, the business, the kids, the cars, the grass, the soccer ball, the dogs, the whole <laughs> lot. And I can jest about it now, yeah. but it wasn't then. It was just, you know, it was incredibly difficult to the point that we're living a life, you know, and a nice life, yeah. and then suddenly my wage went down to $20 a week to survive. Oh, wow. You know? so That's pretty I, hard. I want to touch on that because you actually bring up a really good point because from what I can see is that you found your own purpose <laughs> clear <laughs> for, through Carriage on Kitchen because you wouldn't be fighting like that. And, you know, uh, Phil, I really want to touch on first off, you know, why... How come purpose has become your thing? Do you know what I mean? I believe your message is really clear around uh, getting organizations to be a purpose. And what do you see in Karen's, you know, characteristics that maybe uh, come across around the uh, uh, purpose okay. touch? Some instant analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare you that. So, do that um, off camera, Phil. Ap okay. apart, from, apart from being born and bred in Hobart, Tasmania, which yeah. at the time some people thought of as social disadvantage, um, it's now quite trendy. Mm. I ended up in a corporate role and I was analysing companies' financials and seeing what they were doing. I got really frustrated with poor corporate behaviours and also the companies were just giving to charity and doing things just to protect brand and reputation. And I knew then that if they're really going to change the world um, in a way that we need them to, then you've got to connect it to their bottom line. Mm. So I got interested in that. Um, from a personal perspective, I thought after 17 years, you know, why? Why am I here? What am I doing with my life? Do I want to stay here uh, for the rest of my working life? And, and I said no. So I exited the industry then and made a commitment to investigating this connection between profit and purpose. Mm. And I think the, uh, we'll come onto it soon. There's some telltale traits in there, I'm sure, but we'll, <laughs> we'll come into maybe some of the, the things you look at when you go through that transformation. Yeah, excellent. So um, in terms of, um, sorry, can I just go back to the audience and uh, there's uh, slido.com. Please uh, jump on slido.com. So if you guys want to ask any of our panelists some uh, any questions at all, please uh, send that through. We'd love to see them uh, on board. Uh, but I wanted to touch on, you know, I guess some three key uh, performing sort of, uh, you know, at your best every day. So I guess, uh, Dr. M, you you uh, analyze this, you've worked on this really well. So, um, you know, people talk about, uh, a lot of people talk about resilience, but really they don't know what resilience is until they are mm -hmm. in it. <laughs> so, so none of us do because uh, we know, we've heard stories of uh, people learning things the hard way. I definitely, you know, am the school of the hard knocks. That's what I call it. <laughs> um, but uh, resilience comes from that. But if you can give us three uh, characteristics that you define, you know, every day that, at, that has you performing at your best, can you uh, elaborate a little Absolutely. bit on that? Absolutely. I think when you're going through tough times and you've got the house, the kids, the soccer ball, and any other sporting piece of equipment that you had on the line that back then, Karen, is when, you, when you're really under the pump, you need to have your foundations in place. So the three key areas that I look at every day uh, in, in my action steps I'm taking is, number one, my prime real estate of the day, which I consider to be the first half hour to hour of your day. Are you starting your day consciously or are you starting your day unconsciously? When the alarm goes off, are you rehearsing your day? Are you planning the best day possible or are you already got the shits because you're thinking that the traffic's going to be bad, you've got a bad day ahead at work and you're expecting everything to go wrong versus hoping and planning for everything to go right. That would be the first step. The second step I would say is being aware of your connectedness through the day. Mm -hmm. Who are you actually connecting with? How are you connecting? Are you connecting with people in real life or are you actually connecting completely virtually in all the wrong places? Mm -hmm. That makes a massive difference because it allows us to manage our time and our energy better and also the things throughout our day that we are actually in control of. A lot of people start that day when you're starting your day unconsciously and you're already thinking about all the things outside of your control throughout the day. I'm mm. sure we've all done that, right, where we start off thinking about, oh, my God, we've got that thing we've got to get done at work. It's actually outside of my control, but I'm going to spend the first few hours of my day worrying about it. So what starts off as a relatively small problem ends up being a massive problem before you've even got to work and you can't actually do anything about it in the first place. So being really aware about what within your day you have control of over, what you don't 
don't have control over. And if there's stuff that you're not sure about, is making sure you've got a great coach, a great mentor, a great colleague that can actually point you in the right direction to simplify your day. Yeah, excellent. Uh, you know, as small business owners, we try to separate our business from our lives. But the truth is, it doesn't happen <laughs> most of the time. And, and that's what Growth Gen is really all about. We wanted to combine that mindset with uh, uh, business acumen so that work on a structure or something that creates results for you by integrating your life and your business rather than just having that. So uh, interesting point in terms of, uh, I mean, the reason why I brought up clarity and self-awareness is, 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 is really around that so that we can help a lot of the small businesses that come in here around, um, with, with their business. So uh, Phil, I guess I wanted to touch on, you know, do you have an example of uh, a purpose really well done? So. For small business, you know, you're in the business, um, you're passionate about one particular product, yep. but you don't really see the bigger purpose or you don't see the, uh, the purpose that drives, the real purpose that drives you, you know, to, towards that product. So can yeah. you maybe identify, uh, give us an example of a purpose well, really yeah, well I'll done? I'll give yeah. you an example of someone who's, <clears throat> excuse me, created a really good new product with purpose. And, and I think the challenge is, as you alluded to, that we think about our personal why quite a lot, but our business why is a sort of different conversation. And in small business, it's much in the same. Mm. And if we can combine them, we get a much more powerful outcome for ourselves. And a great example is, is a lady who's a lawyer in Brisbane, who's in family law and dealing with divorces quite a lot. Mm. And she realized that she was turning away six out of 10 people who came up to her practice as prospects because the average cost of a divorce on the family unit is $100,000 in legal fees. And a lot of people can't afford that, so they were going away. But she also knew that a lot of divorces are amicable. So she created a, an online-based system, and it's very intricate. It's not just push a button. There's a process to go through where people going through an amicable divorce can follow this system, and instead of costing $100,000, they get to the end point and it costs them less than 1000 So not only has she created a new line of business for her, which mm. being online, she can scale up across yeah. the whole of, of Australia, um, She's also fulfilling a purpose there, which is helping family units save money, particularly when there's kids involved and you're saving that family unit, say $99,000. That is a really significant positive outcome. So yeah. I just live to find examples like that and help businesses find them. Um, the only catch is every business is slightly different. So you've got a same process, but you often get different outcomes. Yeah, excellent. I mean, that's a fantastic example. Uh, family <laughs> divorce must be stressful enough as it is. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Maria, you, you brought up good stress to me, so I'm going to lead to you. Uh, so why is uh, some stress is good for you? But uh, I guess, you know, let's put that into the context of what uh, Phil said, because uh, family uh, law uh, is quite stressful <laughs> as a whole, I mean, le let alone the touch points. So uh, if you could give us a yeah. perspective around Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I look at stress in three ways. There's good stress, there's bad stress, and then there's ugly stress. Mm. And to take the family law <laughs> example, 100 yeah. grand in family law fees, Ooh. I'm going to say is probably ugly, ugly. stress, ugly right? Stress. Yeah. So the beautiful yes. lawyer up in Queensland has created an opportunity to create what an opportunity for people to move through something that is not a great situation but relatively in a calm way. When we're talking about good stress in general though is that I look at it from a small business point of view of it's where we've got urgency in our life that creates us deadlines. It means we it actually helps us get stuff done. Some stress is actually good. It's actually how we grow. We can't grow in safe spaces, right? And when we're actually going through growth periods, when you went from, what was it, 30 bags to 756,000 biscuits a day? a day. That's pretty yep. phenomenal, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's some serious good stress yeah. to work out how you scale <laughs> to that level, right? Exactly. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I'd make 30 of them. Um, <laughs> But that's where I consider that to be good stress, where yeah. you're actually, you've got some deadlines, you're working towards it, mm. it puts pressure on you to get stuff done. Yeah. If we don't have a deadline, most of us would still be procrastinating. Mm -hmm. When we actually, so that puts us into a state of what I would consider to be alarm. When we're in that stage too long because we can't actually meet our deadlines, that's when we move into a resistant state and it's where it can start showing physical signs and symptoms within our system that we're not adapting to that stress well anymore. And that's where we can start getting sick, which we don't want to be in that space. And we definitely don't want to get to the exhaustion state because that's when chronic illness pops up for people. And let's face it, if you're chronically ill and you're what your business is depending on to be there to function, then 
that turns into that ugly side of stress. So yeah. the good stresses are is when it's creating urgency and pressure to actually assist us to create momentum to get stuff done. And that's the perfect sweet spot to be sitting in most of the time. Yeah, excellent. What a great insight, seriously. Uh, given the uh, fact that the pandemic last year, uh, what P uh, a lot of businesses are going through, especially the hospitality sector, you know, uh, understanding this and really getting some information around this. Um, you know, it's funny, I'm reading a really good book at the moment as well by um, BJ Fogg, uh, Tiny Habits, it's called. You know, just turning small things into, uh, into daily uh, stressless <laughs> activities uh, is is a great way to to um, uh, get through these periods. So, Karen, I just want to touch on you know in terms of resilience. I already mentioned that it's very hard for people to understand uh, resilience. But what are some tips? I mean, I guess what have you been through around that? And and what are some tips that you can give businesses about being more resilient? I think the, the biggest learning from mm. the journey of Courage on Kitchen and my personal journey, yeah. um, EOB, is actually that we were very much like many small businesses. We, you're reactive. Something pops up. It's a little bit about the stress mm. management. Something pops up. Oh, it's urgent. It's, it's more. It needs to be done now because they think it needs to be done now. But if you can turn that into, if you can turn your thinking thinking mindset from reactive to proactive, mm. but you will always have reactive moments within that proactive thinking that you need to make decisions. But start thinking, and for me, that starts about what's the vision? Where do we want to end up? Even if the only thing you think today as a small business owner, we're sitting here in 12 months' time in February 2022, mm. where do you want to be? Mm. Where, what do you? What, what does your business want to look like? And I'd have to say to you, every year in our very early days, we'd get the A4 book out and I'd draw the quarters up and then I'd down, you know, sort of thing, what was we want to look at our team, our finance, our, our product, whatever it might be, and go, mm. right, in this quarter, what do we want to do? Just little habits like that, which was an annual habit. Yeah that we use the good old, you know, when I started, believe me, technology was not around. It was a lot of <laughs> thick books, you know, that we actually did a lot of writing. Yeah. But that forming, think it, that's proactive thinking. There's bound to be a reactive moment come up in your life mm. in the next 12 months, but you've got some sort of idea where you want to be in 12 months. So yeah, that's, great. yeah, definitely proactive thinking. Excellent. Um, so uh, there's a question here. Uh, so for Karen, uh, since you started in 1993, what was the biggest change in the food manufacturing industry and how important are direct sales to consumers today? Uh, very interesting. Mm. So we started in 93, which there was no, there was nothing. There was farm, there no farmer's markets, no, you know, Google, no, none of, no technology as we know it. So we just, you know, there were, there were other avenues by which we could go out and get our learnings and, and understand. In terms of our biggest changes, uh, to tell you the truth, as we've grown and as we've grown a team, I think how many employment law changes have I seen mm. come through? So understanding that and that forms stress. Yeah. So we've needed to have a support network that makes sure, you know, we understand that. In terms of manufacturing, I think keeping on top of technology. So we've actually up to the seventh upscaling in, in the 28 years. And that could be, oh, we started here making this this way or our team looks like this. Every time another good tip, of course, is that's been talked about is add your processes and systems as you go because and Dale talks about that completely. Yeah, That's what Dale does. He does. Processes and systems, whether you record them, you know, we did record them, you know, in a good old Word document to what can be done now and what apps are available mm. just to make your job easier Easy. and to reflect. And what's written is, you know, can be changed, is done. Did I answer the entire question or did I miss something <laughs> in all of that? Well, I was just going to say, like, you should be super proud because everyone keeps saying how manufacturing is really tough in Australia uh, and for an Australian manufacturing company. I don't know much about manufacturing, but I know your products. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, but I do know that it is a tough market to, to stick around with, given, given that overseas uh, okay. plays a big factor around that, so which is great. Well. Thank you so much, everyone. Sorry, I, there was a couple more questions, but I can't go through them. But thank you so much. We are run right out of time. I hope you uh, had an insightful uh, panel discussion by um, Dr. Maria, uh, Phil Preston, and Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what we'll Pleasure. do is we'll send out your links to everyone, and uh, they'll get in touch with you. But please stick around. You can jump on chat and make sure you can have a chat to them as well.